have one tab in my play. Uh, no, no. Um, so, I guess everybody has completed in some form the scan matching lab. Um, so, today, I'm hoping to make your life a little bit easier by showing you uh, how to use and how to understand uh, industrial scale package for this land problem. So before we get started, um, just to make sure everybody's awake, uh, who can tell me what SLAM stands for and what generally SLAM is? Well, it's a system, lo system localization. Simultaneous. Simultaneous. All right. Well, just to wake up. Um, so, don't worry, you don't have the um, so, so the problem uh, setting uh, that we're interested in is simultaneous localization mapping. And uh, so, so far, um, you know, this, this has been a pretty well-studied problem. Uh, it actually was, I think, per first posed in maybe the early 80s um, by Hugh Durant White, actually grass lab alone. So, you're in the right place to try out these algorithms, I guess. <laughs> so the localization problem is this idea that given some maps, so we have some landmarks that the robot could see, right? And we know where they are. Where is the robot relative to them? And the mapping problem is sort of the inverse of that. We don't know where the landmarks are, but we know where the robot is, so let's place the landmarks accurately in the global plane. And so each of these problems by itself is relatively easy but doing them both at once is hard. So, just to put it a little more precisely, our goal with SLAM is to use sensor data to build a map and estimate the robot's trajectory in the world at the same time. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give a couple reasons why you might wanna have a map and then you can tell me if you think of any more. Um, but the first reason, at least in this class, is to help us with path planning. Um, so I believe at the first race, you've done reactive methods, and you've done all sorts of hacks to slow the car down on corners, so on and so forth. What if you just knew that there was a corner there because you had a map and you knew where the robot was? Things would be a lot easier. So you can encode a lot of useful priors about the world in this map. And I'll show you an example in a minute of, of something a bit more complex. The second, second reason that we really want this type of system is, uh, I don't know if you ever closed your eyes and like tried to walk from point A in a room to point B. If they're far away, your dead reckoning ability is not very good. You're going to accumulate error, and before you know it, you know, you're 10 meters off from where you wanted to go. So by solving SLAM specifically, the localization problem, we're able to sort of reset these errors online. So we don't have this uh, quadratic growth in our odometry uh, estimate error. Um, and this is really important because you know, if I give you an IMU or just you know real odometry and you try, try to drag a robot around and quote localize, it won't work. And try it for yourself if you haven't had that lovely experience yet. Later, uh, you know, I'll bring up this notion of do we really need a map, uh, or what kind of map do we need, but that's more a forward-looking statement, and I think it is open to debate right now, uh, sort of, on the research and development side, so Tesla doesn't use a map, but Waymo does, what are the relative benefits of the two approaches? We can discuss it after we understand sort of the basic problem. So, as I mentioned, this topic has been studied for a while, and some people would, would say that it's, it's mostly solved. Um, and so the historical development began around 1986, and uh, some people used things like extended Kalman filters and particle filters um, to try and solve the slant problem. And we'll talk a little bit more about the particle filter setting next class. Um, we're not going to use it for SLAM because it 
is less speedy, it's less efficient than the approach that we're going to talk about. Uh, but if you just want to do localization, particle filters are still great. Um, in the modern era, the, the problem has been defined. Like we, we know what the slam problem is, we know what the equations look like, but the real contributions have been algorithmic. You know, as you saw with this PLICP paper, right, the basic problem is pretty simple, but making it fast is clever or tricky. Um, so, just to expound on why you might want to map. So this is a, a lab, uh, let's say, on the West Coast. We did some experiments with F110 cars. And uh, you can see that we're running an object detector. And, and sorry for the lag, it's, it's actually ROS. It's not uh, the screen recording mechanism is slow. Um, so when the car gets about here, there's a stop sign. OK? And this object detector is YOLO. It's pretty good. I've actually rarely seen it fail. But if you have a map, you can say that in the past, I've noticed that there's a stop sign here. So if you're here and you're telling me that there's not a stop sign, you should be very concerned. Either the environment's changed or your detector's bad. So SLAM and using what you know this would be called like a high definition map, although I don't know how high definition this recording is, um, is a way to make your perception systems more robust. And that's why some people favor it. Okay. And so there's really been three errors uh, in the study of this problem. And EKF, extended common filters, was, you know, you still see papers on this. You'll, you'll see it in, in uh, binocular visual inertial odometry, things like that. It's related, but it's not the same problem. But there was really a big revolution around the year 2000 um, with what I would call probabilistic robotics. So Sebastian Thrun, Wolfram Bogard, and uh, Dieter Fox um, wrote this book. Everybody should read it, have a look. It's widely available online uh, as a draft. Um, but, but this was sort of state of the art until recently. And what we're going to talk to you about today is the recent version of this, which some people call graph slam or maximum a posteriori estimation. And it's primarily an algorithmic trick uh, to solve some of the nasty problems that you get with the particle filter. So um, the way that this lecture is going to go is I'm going to start with an overview of Google Cartographer. I don't know if you've ever looked at it and tried to make sense of what's going on in this repository. It's huge. There's thousands and thousands of lines of code. I'm going to show you from a bird's eye view what all the different pieces do. Uh, as part of that, I'm going to explain that in SLAM, there's typically a front end and a back end. Two different systems that work together to solve the problem. And then we'll go in depth on each of those. Finally, uh, I have some notes about how to install and use Cartographer on this vehicle, the F110 car. Um, they are from uh, maybe last year, and I have a big warning that says, please go to the Google Cartographer, read the docs, and follow their instructions as they currently exist, because they change it quite frequently. And uh, really, the only method that works is to follow their rules exactly. Um, so there's still many useful things in there that haven't changed, but please be careful. The warning is mainly considered that this is recorded, and I don't know when people will be watching it. So uh, the problem that we're interested in is SLAM, and in particular, we're looking at it sort of in uh, small corridors and buildings with a robot equipped with a 2D LiDAR. And uh, it's maybe surprising that Google published this, not Waymo, uh, but really it's all about their Google Maps interface and the ability to sort of capture these public spaces and you know, have a map inside of a museum rather than just roads sort of unstructured built environments um, that don't necessarily align with the plans that the architects drew up. Um, so the, the main contribution of the cartographer paper uh, is a little subtle. It's not what we're mostly going to talk about today. 
but if, if you read this in plain English, it's that it's fast. Okay? Uh, the, the problem that they are trying to solve specifically is hard to do in real time on uh, computationally constrained hardware. And so they come up with a very clever way of solving it quickly. But the idea, like the way the pieces work in general, is what we're going to focus on today. And uh, if you want to get into the guts of their nonlinear optimization solver, that's something you can do in a time. So uh, how many people have used a slam package like AMCL? Or uh, what are some of the other common ones in ROS? Uh, anybody? Only one person? Have you ever uh, driven your robot around the hallway and gotten back to the start? What happens? Uh, be a bit tough. So at least in the map, it doesn't get back to the start. Uh, and so this problem is known as the loop closure problem. Okay? When you revisit a place that the robot has already been, and the transformations between the scan that you recorded don't actually line up to revisiting the start. Okay, and so you'd like to fix this. Oh, here's what it looks like. Um, this is with cartographer, so the correct thing happens. So look, we've gone all the way around the MLAB loop, and are always pointing sort of a little skewed from 90 to where it should be. But when we get here, we close the loop. So we realize that we came back to the same place that we started at, and uh, everything starts to line up very nicely. There. This is what we want, right? We, we don't want to deal with fudging like intersections between the loop that we drove with the car, right? That'll never work well. Can anybody think of a, a challenging aspect of this? What, what's the problem? You don't know if it's like a perfect loop or if the hallway actually does slant off. Yeah. You don't have prior knowledge. So, so, very close, very good point. Uh, I think maybe I'm going to sound like a broken record since we talked about this in lecture two. The problem here is false positive. So if you add a loop closure constraint where one shouldn't exist, your whole map is, is really in bad shape. There's not a lot you could do to recover from that. Um, so uh, we'll talk about the loss function that they use to make sure that this doesn't happen and sort of the general structure of the software. So. This is an overview of the cartographer SLAM system. And the very first thing that's important is what kind of data does this system require? Or can, what kind of data can it use? And so it can take in range data. And so that can either be a laser scan or a point cloud. So this works with 2D and 3D LIDARs. We're going to use it with a 2D LIDAR. Uh, it can take in estimated of the odometry or pose. And so, do we have that? Anybody? Yes, I see some heads. If we calibrate it. Yeah, where do we get it from? The ESC. Correct. So, for posterity from the desk, the ESC. And hopefully everybody in the class has calibrated this, because if you didn't, this, the rest of this won't work that well. <laughs> uh, all right, sounds like some maybes. Um, you can also add in IMU data. And so you use this with a motion model, perhaps. And uh, also, sort of, if you have maybe some markers in the world that you know their pose exactly, you could add those as well. Uh, we don't use either of those things. I believe that your new VESCs, the VESC 6 Plus, have an IMU. Um, so you could extend Cartographer to use that if you feel that it's useful. And there are cases where it could be. Uh, I'll leave it at that. All right, so that's just the data that we're going to take in with the system. Um, what's actually, what is actually going to be done with it? So the first part is called local slam. And this is kind of the problem that you've solved already. This uses a scan matcher. Okay? We're not going to use your scan matcher, uh, for better or worse. Um, you guys look so sad. Uh, not the best. OK, so, so we have a, the, the, the local slam uh, portion is building these things called submaps, and I'll explain them in detail. 
but you can consider them like little chunks of the environment where you register consecutive point scan, uh, laser scans relative to one another. Okay, and you'll notice that there's some extra stuff in here. So uh, there's a motion filter. Um, basically what this is doing is throwing away uninteresting sets of data. So if you don't move very far, or you don't rotate very much, it says, eh, I'm not getting any new information from this, I'll drop that measurement. Um, and you can see what it produces is a sub-map, which is a voxel grid, and it's a special kind of uh, occupancy grid because each cell has a probability associated with it rather than a binary number. More about that in a moment. Okay. So in general, the job of local SLAM is to generate good submaps. And uh, how hard do we think this is? I mean, scan matching is kind of hard, but let's say that you're Google and you have 50 engineers working on scan matching and you solve it pretty nicely. Um, what's the trick here? Anyone? Would you rather make a map of a 50,000 square foot building or a tiny closet, which is easier? Yeah, but the smaller space, right? So, because we know that our me measurements, like odometry, they drift over time, right? And our scan matching, it accumulates error. So, uh, if we just do it for a short amount of time, that map should be pretty good for relative poses, right? Yeah. So, so that's the idea here. Okay. But we don't want submaps. We want a map of the entire track, right? And so the job of Global Slam is to figure out how all these submaps fit together. And this is where the loop closure piece can happen, right? So if you detect that a scan you just got is most likely from a particular submap that you've already seen, right? You could close the loop. Um, so again, the job of Global Slam is specifically to tie all these submaps together in a way that makes sense. And just for clarity, these two pieces are running at the same time. Um, so the local slam is obviously solving, I don't know if it's obvious, but it's solving an easier problem and it runs very fast. The global slam maybe fires every one third of a second and tries to make sense of what's happened uh, over some history. Okay, so let's talk about local slam first. And I'll start with pictures, and we'll get to that. Um, so probably, I mean, in the past when I've explained this, the word submap has been confusing. Um, but pictorially, it's just a little chunk of the world. And uh, it's not necessarily of a certain spatial size. Actually, you determine that a submap is complete when you've received some set number of range measurements. Okay, And this is why I told you about that motion filter. Right? So if you're not moving, right, you're going to drop a bunch of these range measurements and it will take longer to collect the submap. Right? It's not like a fixed time horizon, right? because the LiDAR comes at a constant rate, but you're not taking every measurement. So um, the space and the time it takes to collect the submap may vary. What's fixed is the number of range measurements only. Okay? Uh, in my picture, I've drawn a coordinate system on each submap. So each submap has a transform from the world to the submap. Um, submaps need to be small enough that your measurements don't drift a lot uh, during the, this sort of determination. So if you think your scan matcher works well for about 100 steps, right, or 10 steps at some speed, that's the size of your submap. Um, to be very clear, like. All of these parameters, there are things you can tune. Um, and you will be able to do this if you want to, uh, if you think it helps uh, your performance in the race. We've given a pretty good initialization. So I know that we can at least map the tracks that you'll be racing on, uh, but it could be made better. Okay. So inside a submap, right, we need to register scans relative to each other. Right? And this, this happens with the scan matcher. Okay, but it's, it's not ICP, and I'll tell you what it is later. And 
And uh, I guess maybe a definition, when we talk about, when I say local, I guess in this talk, what I mean is uh, measurements derived from odometry or recent scan overlaps and result in scan matches. So it, it, I'm just talking about like a short history of these things. Okay. So once the motion between consecutive scans is found by the scan matcher, it goes through the motion filter, right? which is what I told you about earlier. And basically, this can just drop some scans that are uninteresting. So if you don't move, uh, the constraint that that's going to imply on your optimization problem is redundant. Um, there's nothing really good that can come of, of adding that measurement. And uh, this filter can use uh, distance, relative distance that you moved, uh, the changing angle, or some time threshold. And again, you can set all of these things. Uh, Cartographer is a very sort of customizable modular piece of software. So what, what are these submaps actually? Um, how would you, okay, who, who knows about occupancy grids? Okay. Uh, who wants to explain an occupancy grid to me? It's a discretized set of space. So you take a room, you divide it into a certain amount of squares, mm -hmm. and that square is an occupancy. So, so if you had a, a laser scanner, how would you decide if a cell is occupied or not? So in its way, whatever it's long time would be occupied and then that whichever object goes over, they are not. Good. Yeah. Okay. Did everybody, everybody understands this concept? So we're just trying to encode what is free space and what is occupied, and there's an easy way to update that uh, with a laser scan. If you know your world to scan transform. Why do we need a motion filter? Like, doesn't the scan at the same place help you increase your confidence about your scanners? Uh, so, and your localization. yes, but if it's exactly the same, uh, I think just the noise uh, makes the optimization problem harder to solve. Uh, it would be very sensitive to any error. Uh, I'll say more in a minute. So to be clear, we're not filtering out everything like that. If you saw that there's also a time threshold. So uh, if you let the car sit for long enough and it doesn't move, it will still start building this grid. It just filters the measurements. Um, so probability, or probabilistic occupancy grids, I think is the term I prefer. They're a 2D table. Each cell has a fixed size. And instead of being 0 or 1, occupied or not, they have a probability that there exists an obstacle within that cell. So for any point in my robot's workspace, let's say in R2, right, I can find a corresponding IJ index for a cell and look up the probability that there exists some obstacle within that cell. Okay? And so these uh, grids are obviously updated online. So how does that happen? So the, the kind of measurement, range data measurement that we have is a 2D laser scan, right? And we've seen you know, these pictures of LIDARs a billion times in this class where you know, we start from some theta and there's a, a step between the angles and at each index of that array, we get a distance, okay? So for every point that we get back, right? We're going to put it in the hit set and insert it into the closest grid point. Okay, so recall we're going to start from zero zero. Let's say we do a laser scan. We have in polar coordinates, right, all the points that were hit. We're going to convert it to Cartesian coordinates x y, and then we're going to find the i j index, which corresponds to that x y. And if we hit it uh, on the very first step, we're just going to at some probability p hit. Okay, so maybe a return, you say, counts for 0.67. This is sort of uh, empirically derived. Um, but the values in cartographer are good. You don't have to play with it. Um, for every miss, we're going to insert um, the associated pixels that intersected the array of the scan. And we're going to say this was uh, get some probability p miss. Okay? 
And uh, if it's yet to be observed, it's uh, just assigned some value, uh, usually PMIS. We just, it's arbitrary. Um, so here's the submap. It's, uh, it's a map from R to, to uh, the integers. Um, and we have this function called odds. So odds is how we're going to update the probability within the grid. Okay, so odds is just p over 1 minus p. And you can see the update down here. I'm going to do it in more detail next slide. It's odds inverse of odds at the whole point times odds of uh, p hit. Right, so let's say that we get a, a, a hit in this particular cell. Okay, uh, so we're going to add uh, x to the hit set. And the grid point has yet to be observed, so we assign it p hit 0.67. Clear? Okay. Uh, so m old is 0.67. And we get a new scan, and this particular cell is hit again. Okay. And so p hit, remember, is 0.67. So odds of p hit is 2.03. So that's uh, 0.67 divided by 1 minus 0.67. Okay. And uh, we know that the, the odds for m old is also the same thing because it's the first time we observed it, so we just got the hit. So you multiply those two together, and you take the inverse, and you get 0 0.8. So you can see that the value, the probability that there was something in this cell went from 0 0.67 to 0 0.8 the second time we observed it. And this will continue, you know, so on and so forth, the more times you see uh, uh, registered scans, hit this particular cell. Is, is this okay for everybody? I, I know it's uh, maybe easier if I did it on the board, but it's clear, right? Um, the more times you see a cell get hit, the higher the probability that there's something in it. And so instead of having a black and white grid, you have something that looks like a grayscale image. Oh, it's just making sure it's between zero and one. Uh, there's a reason for that later, and it's a little dumb. But. So they use a bicubic interpolation to smooth this out, and that can allow the thing to jump uh, over one, which doesn't make any sense for probability. So, um, is there an odds payload and not a probability Uh, Sure. Yeah. But they, they do clamp it to between zero and one. They're, they're interpreting it as a probability. I, it's. So they clamp it and not scale it. Yeah. And the, the primary reason for the clamping is because sometimes they operate on a smooth version of this in which they interpolate it between the points and they don't have any guarantee that you can't go over one of that interpolation. So it's like a clamp to saturate it's about one. Yeah. We're doing this for all the the bids in on the scan, right? Yeah. Not just the Correct. So the, the, the ones are that is not the endpoint are exactly analogous to subjects for penis. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, cartographer has great visualization tools uh, if YouTube works. So the red dots, that's the laser scan from the robot. Uh, you can see over here, this is like a slime trail of where the robot was, and then this is the current estimate of the robot. And I don't know if the lighting is good enough, but this area, that is the hallway, is gradually becoming lighter. Okay, so that means that the value of those grid cells uh, is becoming closer to zero because we keep seeing that there was P missing in there. Okay. Whereas the edges, they're becoming darker. It'd be easier to see a different background, but uh, for the 
those. So that, that, that's the general idea of what's going on with the submap and how it works, how it's updated. in the visualization, are those from the submap uh, transformed to each point that you're updating it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's kind of exactly what I was about to say, is uh, why did we spend two lectures on scan matching? Uh, well, we need to register these endpoints of the scan to a particular uh, point in the world frame. Okay. So, if we just keep staying in the scan frame, right, we, we don't know if we're hitting the same cell as before or not. Everybody, is that clear? Right, we, need, we need to figure out the relative uh, transform between consecutive scans so that we can register endpoints to map to the correct cell. But when you transfer from submap to submap, mm -hmm. is the occupancy greater than that too? Yes, each submap starts, is, is initialized. Yeah. Okay. So like, say, you should scan all the way down the hallway. Mm -hmm. Those points are gone. Uh, to the next no, no, those will still be in there, but there'll be another submap with a new, uh, you know, uh, transform associated with it. They could overlap. Uh, I don't think we never restricted that from happening. Okay. Um, what you'll be interested in is the transformation between submaps uh, to the world frame, so that they're relative positions. Uh, those become constraints. But, um, how do we decide the sub submap? But you need to know right. it's, the size of it. It's form. just uh, the number of, of range measurements that you're going to allow. And it's something that you just set before you start. What do you say the number of range measurements? So, I mean, uh, let's say a range measurement is a complete scan and you're going to take 100. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just so where would they hit? That would be the map. That would be the submap. Yeah. It, it's not constrained spatially. It's constrained by this number that you choose. That makes sense. And when you divide it into submaps, you keep the same submap for the short period of time yeah. to do the grid. I guess put the point yeah. zero so like the probability is yeah. there, or do you change as you move? Like so, so uh, the for the sub a particular submap, it gets initialized right at the beginning. At the beginning, system. right, and you update it and update it and update it, and then when you go to a new one, it's, it's initialized as well. So okay. isn't it when you initialize it, it's based on your um, scan? Yeah. And your scan has noise. So yeah. how do you like you you, you do multiple well, scans well, until you decide the submap? So, so the whole reason that we're interested in sort of these uh, local transformations between you know nearby measurements mm -hmm. is that we would be expecting to see the same features in the environment over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you saw the video, what happens? Right. The walls are essentially not moving relative to the robot. Right. And the space that is between the walls, the hallway itself, where it is also consistently measured as P-mist. You, you see it go from, I have no idea, to I'm very certain that there's no obstacles here. And so that's how you, you sort of deal with the noise. So if you were to run a cartographer and somebody was walking around in front of the robot, right, but then you, you did the loop again, it will get rid of the person. It's, it's uh, pretty good at that, actually. No, I'm, I'm actually asking, um, I understand like how to get better and better mm -hmm. in a specific submap, yep. but um, um, I'm going to understanding when how to decide the submap. So you said yep. so the first measurement a fixed number of measurements. Yeah, and then we'll get to the optimization portion, how we figure out the relative poses of the scans. That's what's, what we're going to talk about next. Um, Are the occupancy grids for the submaps like a fixed size? Um, like if you were to they drive past an open hallway, they have a fixed resolution. Okay. Uh, they don't have a fixed spatial extent. Okay. Although, I imagine that there is some limit that you could hit. <laughs> uh, but the way that you control their size is with the number of range measurements that make up a submap. I mean, like if you were to drive past like an open hallway, yep. and you got range measurements from like yep. very far away, would yep. the submap expand to include yes. those? Or would it? Okay. I'm sure earlier had like the long hallway. Than the short ones where it was going uh, slower. No, you get that. Uh, you had like multiple range going from a point and you had multiple on those points, so those are like your temporary global range. Yeah, so we'll get to that. Those are constraints. And uh, cartographer decides to add constraints 
So it treats all the poses that it registers for the scans as a graph, right? And if you measure them consecutively, then there's an edge between those poses, and that edge describes the transformation from pose one to pose two. Uh, and that becomes a constraint because both of those things are also going to have transformations back in the world frame. And so measuring the error between what the relative difference in the world frame would be and what the relative difference in the submap frame would be is how we do the global pose optimization. Um, so uh, I think it, it's safe to say that you've had all kinds of fun with PLICP and trying to get it to work. And one of the things that you should have noticed is that it's not very robust. Um, and your initial guess for the optimization matters a lot, and your ability to figure out the correspondence between points also matters a lot. So cartographer does not use ICP. It uses what's called a correlative scan matcher, and uh, does not require correspondences. Um, it would have required a lot more machinery uh, to do this yourself. So that's why we chose ICT. It's relatively simple, but also it helps you understand the failure modes right, um, of this algorithm and, and sort of why we like this particular implementation that we have now. And so, as I said, correlation based methods search for a rigid body transformation uh, between the poses. Uh, and scans without computing any correspondences, and it projects one set of liar points to query scan on top of a reference map. So this reference map is this probabilistic occupancy rigid building on one. Um, so generally, the reference map is going to be a lookup table, and it assigns a cost for every projected query point. Okay, how does this work? Okay, we're going to solve a nonlinear least squared optimization problem. So uh, this guy here. That's your pose in the submap, and that is a decision variable. Okay, so that's what we're choosing in order to uh, try and minimize this function here on the right. So the summation is from k equals 1 to k. That's over every scan, right? And if you remember, submap is defined by the number of range measurements or scans that will be included in it. So we always know what the k is. Okay, so a um, couple of things. M smooth is your submap, uh, but we've applied a bicubic interpolation to it. So it has a continuous representation rather than discrete. Uh, con convenience for this, the solvers that they use. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. So if I want to query M smooth, what do I need? I need to know uh, x, y point that I'm interested in. Okay. How do we do that? So for each scan, we're going to convert it to the submap's reference frame, it's T, transform. And then these are the scan itself. Scan K is H. Okay. And we're going to see how likely it was that this was a hit uh, according to the probabilistic occupancy. Does that make sense? Right. So if it's lined up well, you're going to get a number close to one here. Right. 1 minus something close to 1 is small, and that means that your transform was nice, and you've minimized this function, and you can go home now. Does that, that make sense to everybody? It's not similar to Paris 1, it's like, you are trying to find out. It's similar, uh, but note that we're, we're not doing all this point to line metrics. Right? Everything is rasterized here. And it's treated as a uh, likelihood, a log of likelihood. Okay. Is the uh, scan return the coordinate of scan return? Is it only once? Like what is? Uh, so this would be like you, you could do it as a matrix, or you could do it point by point, right? Uh, so this is like x y. It's an array of x y's, right? Okay. So the big vector of x comma y. But does, does this make sense? So basically, if you line up your hits with what the probabilistic occupancy grid says, you'll get one minus something that's almost one, and your loss will be small, and you will have minimized the function by selecting a good transform. Okay. 
How computationally expensive is it to have that bicubic interpolation uh, generated? Uh, I, it's pretty trivial. Um, yeah, everything about a cartographer is supposed to be fast. Uh, so I think you gain a lot more by smoothing it out for the optimization than you would lose by doing the encoding. Um, and in particular, uh, they use a, a backend called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. It's, again, 50 engineers from Google making a very robust nonlinear least square solver, uh, which requires significant time investment to figure out how to use. Uh, I'll leave it Maybe it's easier with Julia Opt right now, but I, I haven't tried it recently. Um, so um, I'm giving you the flavor of the problem. I'm not telling you how they actually find uh, the, the transform, but this is the optimization thing. So. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the transformation mm -hmm. such that every point is occupied. There is a to minimize one minus. Yeah, well, so these are hit points, right? And the hits get assigned big values in this uh, probabilistic occupancy group, right? We saw what happens when we get multiple hits on the same cell, right, we would uh, get, if, if PK is 0.67, I get like three or four hits, now all of a sudden we're like getting 0.9 for that cell. Yeah. So it means we wind up things nicely. And then properties are probably in the cells of the same thing. Yeah. And so, and so this is going to proceed iteratively, right? At the start, you have nothing, so you're going to get a big loss, and the, the transformation is sort of arbitrary. You can make it better by using that odometry information. That's why we like it. Right. But once you get going, uh, you're really going to want to line up a lot of the features from the previous scan, the current scan. Um, and, and sort of this is why we don't really care about consecutive measurements where you don't move, because it won't change the answer to this problem if you solve it well. Right. You wouldn't expect it to change. Okay, so that's the front end, uh, and you saw what it looks like. We built these little grayscale maps uh, that have a transformation back to the world frame, right? And then they register each scan from your robot sensors to a position relative to the local coordinate frame itself. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. You said that they had a transformation to the world frame. Correct. And the, this world frame is where we started from. Yeah, so, so there's always a fixed reference frame that never changes that has some zero, zero, zero where your map lives. Okay, and so you're moving relative to that as you create these. Wherever you start is zero, zero, zero according to this, so. Does that mean that we're also take, so to have this transformation from the world frame, does that mean we've taken into consideration every transformation from, in all the submaps that we've generated? That is exactly what we were about to do. <laughs> Oh, so, yeah. Oh. Okay, so so you actually have done a very rough version of this right now by just optimizing the local submaps, right? But you, the reason we are interested in making them small is because we know it drifts a lot. But aren't, aren't we going to have the same drift if we keep considering those transformations? Um, so, yes, if you didn't do something about it. So what happens is that, um, uh, I think these are great questions. So uh, sort of a silly version of this would be that, that you just try and do loop closure and find when you return to a submap. What this is actually doing is, is um, it's accomplishing that, but it's able to adjust the transform between every single measurement that it's ever made and the poses of the submap at the same time. So, so this is computationally a much harder problem Right, which is why it runs in the background at like a tenth or a hundredth of the speed that the local submap generator runs at. So that's why we talk about front ends and back ends, right? And so most of the big contributions in this space are how to do these up these back end updates really efficiently. So if you've seen like uh, G2O or ISAM or any of these things like or, or sparse bundle adjustment, I'm sure you've run across this in some ICRA paper that you were trying to read. That's what they're talking about how to solve this back-end problem efficiently. Um, we know how to formulate the optimization problem, but there's different ways in which you can actually implement the solution that have 
their relative benefits, and mostly in terms of speed is what you care about. So let's let's get to it. Okay. So go ahead. Hey, sorry. Can you go back a few more slides? Sure. Sorry. Also, these are on Piazza. If uh, oh. anybody. Um, so in here you you have one minus, which is you were talking about the ones that are hit. We yep. care about the ones that are hit. Yep. Why don't we care about the ones that are not hit? Why don't we consider that? Now? I mean, they're sort of implicit. And what would, what would they be implicit? Well, because if you think the ones that, that were not hit are hit, right, then you're going to get a bad score here. That's all. Um, it's, it's a rigid body. You, you have to move everything together. Uh, it's a good question. I, I'd have to think about more if it actually okay. could improve anything, but uh, my initial thought is no. You've already implicitly encoded the fact that the other ones aren't hit, given that you said that this cell was hit. Because the, the laser can't travel through things that are hit, right? Yeah. OK. Um, so. We, we sort of started out this, this journey into looking at cartographer with a, an annoying problem that you find in, in sort of local SLAM implementations or sort of the old school stuff, right? It's that when you get back to some place that your robot's already been, uh, that you or I could easily tell is the same place, that SLAM can't do anything about it, right? Once you've had this drift accumulate, you end up with hallways that are loops that don't connect to each other extremely frustrating. And so the goal of the back end is to solve this problem. To know when you return to a submap that you've already visited and make sense of everything. Right? This, this is what makes your maps end up looking like they have 90 degree corners like they really do with built environment. Right? Uh, is this loop because of the drift or is it something else? Like if I didn't have a loop, will there still be the drift? Uh, so actually, because it's so good at solving this, uh, it fixes a lot of the problems with the trip. So, so when you're trying to make uh, when you're trying to make maps, uh, whereas in, in sort of AMCL or some of those other packages that don't have loop closure, you really wouldn't want to keep going around the same circle because you're just going to destroy the good parts of the map that you have. In cartographer, you kind of explicitly want to keep driving over the same place so that it can realize that there's a constraint. There's like a if I didn't have a loop, would the other packages be fine or will there be? Uh, no, there's still going to be drifting. They'll still be fine, right? Uh, it just won't be so obvious. Uh, so, uh, anyway, they'll be topologically wrong if there is anything, which is, I think, problematic. Like, if, if you're trying to plan right, how to get from A to B, and you think some corridor doesn't connect to another corridor, but it really does, like, you'll say it's infeasible, but in fact, you're just inches away from crossing the threshold. <laughs> It's, it's really makes robots do dumb things. Um, go ahead. So, uh, these are just working on 2D LiDAR data. Yep. So, does Cartographer uh, use the same optimization for 3D LiDAR and 2D? Uh, so, we're not going to get into it, but my understanding is yes, it uses the Series Solver backend. And part of the reason that they chose uh, the correlative scan matching approach is that it generalizes to that. Um, but uh, in that case, uh, you'll, you'll have to do something more than a 2D, you know, it'll be a voxel grid, not a 2D grid. But it uses voxels in different Yeah, but I think in 3D you're going to have to deal with the, the Z position. Yeah, that is yeah. a voxel grid. Right? Yeah. So I think in the map that you actually record, the flow chart of the board, in that you yeah. use. Yeah, there's, there's a voxel uh, grid. Uh, but I mean, if it's 2D, you can still use voxels, right? It's just everything zero. So uh, it does handle 3D LiDAR. Um, I have not successfully used it yet um, due to the lack of a 3D LiDAR, $5,000, uh, but maybe one day. Um, so, so here's the same picture we keep seeing, right? And uh, again, our goal is to find out when we return to a submap that we've already seen. And so, what Cartographer does uh, on the front end is generate these constraints, and they're in the form of relative poses. 
uh, so this uh, j, right? Uh, and where i is a particular, uh, I want to get this right, i is a submap and j is a scan within a submap. Okay? Uh, and so for any pair of submap i and scan j, there's a constraint uh, cij, uh, which describes where the submap coordinate frame, uh, it describes where the scan was relative to the submap coordinate frame when you had the matching. Uh, so, so this is coming from that optimization problem that I just showed you. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, so just sort of casually, right, this long hallway, we're probably not going to get a good loop closure in there. But this corner got lots of features. It's really unique in this map. You'd probably be able to get a good loop closure in there. And back to my earlier point, you don't want to be adding these just arbitrarily. Because if you get one wrong, it's a disaster. Um, it's hard for the optimizer to recover from that kind of thing. Okay, so this is yet another nonlinear least squares problem, but it looks significantly uglier than the previous one. Um, and so you'll notice first that there's uh, two sets of decision variables now, uh, not one. Okay, so we have the submap poses and the scan poses. This is why people might refer to this as global rather than local, or back end, right? So we are also trying to figure out where the submaps are in the world, not just the scans within the submaps. Okay, uh, one half is there for convenience, but what we're summing over is all pairs i, j of submaps and scans. Is that clear? Okay. This row uh, is something, uh, oh man, I'm going to pronounce this wrong so you can all laugh at me. It's going to be on recording. Uh, Uber loss, Uber loss, I don't know. I'm sure there's another way to say it. Uh, okay, it's a special loss function that I'll show you a graph of in a minute. But what you can think of it as doing is, uh, sort of uh, not allowing things that are potentially way, way wrong to have too much influence on this summation. So it behaves like a parabola around zero, and everywhere else it has sort of linear behavior. So I'll show you a picture in a minute. But the reason for this, as I keep saying, is you don't want to close the loop when you shouldn't have, and uh, if, if you sort of get perturbed by every noisy measurement that could be in another submap, then you know this this optimization problem is going to be very uh, poorly behaved. Um, okay, so next, there's this huge mess inside E squared. So E is a residual or it's a loss function. Okay, and you can see that it needs the arguments of the submap poses, the scan poses, the covariance of the transformations between uh, any of these measurements, which you can trust that series uh, will compute for you. Um, that's a whole other topic, and I've, I've given you some references if you want to look up how they do it, um, as well as these constraints, which are uh, between consecutive uh, poses or scans. Um, okay. So just remember, relative pose between submap and scan, and we're calling that a constraint. Okay, so this, this big function, uh, which they didn't bother to write out too clearly, um, basically takes the difference between the constraint and uh, the pose that you uh, would have recorded mapped from the world frame back to the submap frame that you're assuming that it came from. All right, so if you pick the wrong submap, right, this is going to be uh, a large number. If you pick the right submap, it's going to be a small number. Okay, and really, uh, let's see which paper. Uh, this Conalisi paper, uh, if you want a sort of a more intuitive explanation of this, uh, please go ahead and have a look at that. Um, but because we've included all the, the submap poses, uh, and we've not actually like fixed any of these scans to necessarily belong to a particular submap. They're, they're the decision variable. Uh, we are able to get this loop closure behavior, and uh, 
it's especially important that we don't get too upset and, and about noisy measurements and, and drive our, our optimizer crazy. So this is this Uber loss, right? Uh, so if you're within some delta around zero, it behaves just like a quadratic function. And fine, everybody likes this. Uh, if you are outside of that delta, yeah, it looks like this. It's like, so basically, what happens is instead of blowing up, you get uh, sort of nicer, less aggressive behavior from the loss. Okay. So uh, that's in general the back end, and. Before you go, this is a huge subject. There's entire books on this. There's entire semesters on this. I am trying my best to do it justice in one lecture, but I don't know how sufficient that's going to be. Um, I've given a bunch of uh, online resources uh, that you can have a look at if you really want to know more about how this works uh, or try implementing it yourself. Go uh, okay, so you want it to be very sensitive, like around solutions that are almost good. But for things that are, according to the loss function, way wrong, most likely outliers, you just sort of want to dampen the effect of those particular measurements so that it doesn't drive your optimizer crazy trying to fix that one outlier. That was probably noise or some bug, right? Uh, your sensor. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Right. If you allow, you know, that quadratic loss to shoot off to infinity, not that fast, but fast enough that it dominates every other term in the function. So you'll spend all your effort tweaking the transformation for something that was probably an error. So in global optimization, are we just trying to chain submaps until we... Uh, you're allowed to move the poses within the submaps as well. Uh, or even which submap they're, they're best associated with. Um, are we trying to make, make sense of submaps? Which are each other? I think the primary concern is making sense of the submaps with respect to each other. But let's say that your local optimizer didn't do a great job and you've got more information later, this could fix that. Go ahead. Um, would he, so in the video you showed, it had all of the, all of the corners were, I guess, a like a more uh, obtuse angle than they actually were, and then it closed it like this. What happens if it estimates that the angles are all tighter and it looks like a triangle? Is that worse for it? So, so this is sort of the reason that we have the odometry. Uh, the odometry uh, sort of roughly says that you know, how much you turned and how fast you're going when you were doing it, and I should have gotten back to the start. Right now. And so, if, if you, I don't know if it's necessarily better or worse. I've seen it fix itself both ways, mm -hmm. but the trick is to maybe drive multiple loops smoothly and keep seeing the same place over and over again. It usually, eventually figures it out. As long as your odometry is, is reasonable. Uh, so we had some funny ones last year where people had connected the motor uh, backwards. So they swapped some of the leads, uh, and so then they did some hack where they multiplied the speed by minus one. And so you can imagine the odometry is telling everybody the car is going in reverse, and the scan matcher is saying, "No, I'm really going forwards." And <laughs> actually, cartographer is shockingly robust. So you, if you ran it slow enough. <laughs> uh, we could manage to get a map still, uh, but not not very good. Um, so the business gets redundant only when it forms the loop and not when it doesn't see a loop. Um, even when it doesn't see a loop, it's still doing global optimization on the post graph. So it can still lessen the drift at that point too. Uh, don't know the package is uh, We'd have to be more specific about which package. Uh, so, I mean, you could obviously just 
solve the, the you know, registration problem uh, pairwise, just in isolation. Like I had one measurement, now I have a new measurement. What is it transform? Right? Okay, now I'm here. One measurement, new measurement, what is it transform? Right? You could maybe not use all the history of your scans. Right? I, I, don't, I don't know enough detail about the other packages. In the last optimization, what was what covariance was that? Uh, so that's the estimated covariance of the transforms between measurements. Between the measurements. Yeah. Local or all the measurements? All of them. So well it's it's each transform has a coordinate IJ, which is uh, submap I scan J, right? Okay? And so you can imagine that you have a scan that occurred in uh, submap 10, but you want to know the transform from 10 to 5, right? Uh, so, sorry, uh, you want to know what the transform from that scan would be to submap 5, okay? And uh, you're, you're going to compare it against the actual transform that you think from that scan to 5, or, or so from a goal. Um, Am I making any sense? Okay, so the, so, in the, so the uncertainty about your transforms between pairs of submaps and scans. And it's computed by series uh, using some black magic. Okay. And also for the local uh, slam, we talked about the occupancy secret. Do we have a covariance with occupancy secret or not? Uh, Are we assuming you get the cell to be. Uh, so they get the covariance from the occupancy secret. Right but there's no covariance explicitly associated with each cell. Okay. One other question I have is this autographer, like actually for closing loops, or is it something that gets fixed by the optimization? Uh, so that optimization is explicitly trying to close loops as part of its goals. Uh, yeah. But, uh, so does it make a difference if, if you're diving some time with the loops? Uh, sure, it won't be able to say that it returns you to one of the sub that you've seen. Okay. But again, the, the particular form of the loss function does not want to find loop closures unless it's really, really short. Anything else? So, again, there is many resources for this. Uh, this is the 50 minute or so version uh, that we can get through in this class. Um, you could take a whole course on this. It would be a very fun project to try and you know, grab the series solver and, and, and implement some basic version of this. Many people do. Um, if you're interested in working for a self-driving car company and, and doing a slam or being a perception engineer, right, that's something that, that you should think about as a personal project. Uh, there's many interesting research questions associated with this problem. Um, I'm probably not working on them, but, but you could think of some versions of this if you have multiple robots observing the world, right? And you know, you're aware you have a fleet of 100 cars driving around San Francisco, and you have some map and you want to update it, but you don't want uh, you know, to corrupt the map with noisy or, or, or compromised data. Uh, and so one of the problems you might have is that on trash day, there's a bunch of new objects in the world, right? And they appear static to some mapping system like this because you don't observe them for 12 hours. Uh, you know, you have to figure out are, are those trash cans something I should add to the map or not? How does it figure out what are the dynamic parts of the environment? Well, because when you, if you observe that region of the environment again and it's not there, right, it will start downgrading uh, the probability that the environment's occupied. It will do the opposite of seeing the same thing over and over again. It will start graying out that cell. Just look at the update function. Uh, this specific package also works with like addition of cameras and everything, other sensors. To work. Uh, so, so we covered this at the start. It uh -huh. works with IMUs, range measurements that are either point clouds or laser scans, uh, as well as odometry, which you might get from a wheel encoder or in our case from a desk, uh, and uh, fixed landmarks or like beacons that you put in the world. I've never tried that, but apparently it has that functionality. So if you want to use a camera, if you want to use a camera, okay, uh, then 
it's, it's a harder problem, especially if it's monocular, because you don't have this range measurement and the transformation back to world coordinates is, is quite a bit harder. Um, so this is a package called Elastic Fusion. I tried running this in the MIT basement. This is actually the same place that you've seen all those top-down maps of, uh, maybe in the last few slides. This is the, the binocular camera version of this. And uh, so this is using something more like a, a filtering based method. Um, so you have like all the points yeah, so, like, so actually the, the title of this paper, I think, is Dense Land Without a Post Graph. So it, the approach is very different. Um, and uh, it kind of works. Uh, I think it would work a lot better with odometry. Again, this is something you could explore as a project if you wanted. Uh, one, one idea that we've had and tried to do in the past is uh, drive outside. Uh, where the planar lidar is not going to work very well because there's actually uh, not, there's slopes and stuff, and there's no like clear walls for it to bounce off of. So uh, maybe uh, monocular slam or stereo slam is, is something you want to try there. Um, other versions of this, warp slam is a popular package. Uh, this is it working on Kitty. I've been told that everything works on Kitty, and not to be impressed. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, in our, we actually tried this on the card. Um, it doesn't handle rotation as well. Uh, and it, I think it's the same problem that you saw with elastic fusion. Uh, you're going to need to add an IME or some other uh, estimate of that motion. Uh, see, the problem with these is that they have to find patches of the image that they can say in the next frame, these pixels, which may be in a different part of the image, are the same as the pixels I saw in the previous frame. And so when you rotate, let's say around the corner, now you have a bunch of stuff that you could never see before because of the, the, uh, the wall that was in the way. And so they have nothing to match to. So you need to work on solving that problem. Uh, people use this for augmented reality to a great effect. It does run on the Jetson. Uh, you can try it. Um, if you do this kind of project, uh, I wouldn't expect you to get a lot of uh, gain in performance of your vehicle. The tools that we're going to give you are far more reliable but it would expand the environment that you can run the vehicle in, which would be interesting. Yeah, so the, all those little green dots, those are uh, orb features. So basically they have a bunch of colors in them and a metric which maps it to like some you know, identifiable index. And they say, in this frame, this feature was here. In the next frame, this is the same feature, but now it's here. So how must the camera have moved such that uh, you know that transformation happened? And, uh, when we get into detection and tracking, uh, we'll have a sort of detailed lecture on this problem. Yeah, SIFT is one, or is popular as well. Uh, some people have been uh, learning uh, feature descriptors with the neural network. Uh, it's also possible. Um, yeah, if you want, uh, I can't. So, warning: this guy on the internet has some bad language. Big shock to everybody. But uh, George Haas, the guy from Comet AI, uh, does a live coding session where he implements a, you know, a basic version of Warp uh, with G2O and Python uh, mm -hmm. and OpenCV. It's not as hard as it sounds. You, you could do it. It took 10 hours to do it. Mostly just <laughs> dumb mistakes, really, because the, the basic idea I think you could do in, in, in four or five hours if you got the transformations ready. Right. So, um, Uh, again, actually, this is Open Pilot. Uh, Open Pilot doesn't use maps, <laughs> but then you still come up with something like a local map. Uh, well, it's washed out here, but they're taking the, the edges of the road and they're transforming them to uh, the world frame, right? From image space to actual 3D space. And they have uh, two NPCs running that just keep the car centered in the lane and away from the lead vehicle, which is the yellow bar that you can see. Uh, so maybe you don't need maps, but you probably do know, want to know what the constraints are on the free space and, and where you can move in over a short period of time. So this would be, you know, just the front end, essentially, uh, that you would need. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so I have a sh few, all right, I know this is like a long lecture compared to normal but hopefully this part is useful to you. Uh, 
after some pain, a few years ago, I got a cartographer running on a robot. The first and most important rule is don't copy paste stuff from this because it might be out of date. Go to the cartographer, read the docs, and follow their instructions exactly. Some important things I would not put it in the current workspace that you were using. Make a separate workspace. It likes to download weird versions of packages that might cause huge problems. So uh, I think you may see this command is particularly important. Cat can underscore make underscore isolated. Keep it away from the rest of your raw system because I can't doubt for what will happen. Uh, <laughs> They use like the latest version of protobuf and all kinds of like Google stuff that's not on the main branches, so don't don't mess with this if you want to avoid it. Just follow their rules. Uh, it works better. Um, so last semester this worked uh, exactly as I wrote it, but again, double check. So you're gonna make a new workspace, uh, you're gonna clone cartographer into it, you're gonna install this uh, ninja build tool which makes the ability go a little bit faster. I recommend that you have a fresh battery when you start this process. This could take two hours. Um, you might want to, so fresh battery and sudo dot slash jetson clocks is an excellent idea. Um, it'll turn on all the cores and up to the highest clock speed. There's a lot to compile here. Um, there's also some really fun gotchas. Um, so, there's a bunch of Lewis scripts in here, uh, which probably you haven't encountered before, but it's a language that some game devs use. Uh, it's fast, I guess. But if you change stuff and you don't recompile, nothing will happen. Uh, so word to the wise, if you change something, build it again. Or if you like living dangerously, you can edit it directly in the build folder. Uh, just don't forget to actually fix it and skip the build step. Uh, but yeah, be careful. Uh, we have a robot model for you, f 110 2 as well as a launch file which starts up Arviz and Cartographer together with all the correct visualizations. Uh, I would highly recommend watching as the robot builds the map, uh, or even better, drive the robot around the hallway a bunch of times, record a ROS bag, and then you can play the ROS bag back at a slower speed if it's lagging, um, or do it on your big home computer, which has more power than the Jetson, uh, and play with the parameter settings. So you don't actually have to be driving the robot live to tune your parameters if, if you find that to be necessary. Uh, I've had a lot of good success with recording bags and, and doing it that way. So uh, this Lua file, it contains the parameters for the optimization problem. Uh, and it tells uh, cartographer whether or not to use odometry, what topic it's on, how many scans to put in the submap, so on and so forth. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, downside being that they keep changing the API a little bit, but as far as I know, this works. Um, so you're going to get these files from, from the course uh, GitHub, and we'll make this more explicit uh, a little bit later. I need to check with uh, the TAs and see where they end up putting it. Um, I'll update these if they move them. Um, but you're going to get these files, this Lua file and, and this launch file, and you're going to move them into proper directories. So that's basically it. Um, this is the launch file, starts cartographer, starts Arvis. I mean, this, this should be very old hat by now. Uh, the main thing I want to tell you is that all of this should just work out of the box if your geometry is good. Uh, if it doesn't work, double check that your geometry is good. Or complain to me or the TAs that the updated version of Cartographer has broken our source files somehow. And we'll fix it as soon as possible. Um, hasn't been a problem in the past. We have not much of a problem. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, you're going to open up the three terminals. Uh, the first one, I would run Jetson Clocks. 
you want to have you know, maximum compute power available for this task. Uh, once you do that, you can start uh, race car tele and You're going to need to uh, hand maneuver the car around to get this kind of uh, Then in another terminal, you're going to start uh, Cartographer Ross with the F110 underscore 2 bmarch file. Right, that will begin building the map and pop up our biz. Uh, loop closure is super important. Uh, I've had good success like doing three or four laps around MLAP. Uh, again, if you record a bag and the slam, slam starts to go bad, right, it makes a bad loop closure that doesn't exist. Uh, you can know the time that happened and then play the bag again and stop it before that happens. Uh, practically speaking, uh, you know, they, you write paper or whatever, and you read this research, and you think it's all solved, but SLAM is a little finicky uh, in the real world. This is a pretty good solution. It usually works. Um, and yeah, you can play with the parameters if you want. If you look at the region docs, they have some intuition about two new parameters. Um, when you're done, uh, you're going to do Rossform map server, map saver, minus O of the name of the map. Okay. Uh, there is a gotcha here. Um, because cartographer uses probabilistic occupancy grids, uh, the cells and the map file, so the map is a PGM, which is like an image, and a YAML file, which tells like how much physical space a pixel encodes. So we'll say like each pixel is 0 0.25 meters by 0 0.37 meters or something. Um, it stores uh, values between 0 and 255, not 0 and 255. So it's not black and white. And the software that we're going to use for localization wants black and white. So uh, there's a couple options. My preferred one is to use image magic. This is a one-liner. It will convert it to black and white uh, quite nicely. So that's the lecture for today. Um, I will. So the, these slides are already online uh, on Piazza. I will have somebody upload them to Canvas uh, as soon as possible. If that's what we've been doing, I'm not sure. Um, what are you going to do with this? So obviously, this this is a very recipe-oriented thing. You need cartographer on your car. You need to be able to make because the races we're going to have, right, you have a map for MLAB, but you don't have a map for the final race. So MLAB is sort of the practice case. The next race is, is using uh, localization. Uh, if for some reason things don't work, you have a backup. But the sort of deliverable for this lecture is going to be that you install Cartographer, and you make a map of MLAB, and then come find the TAs if things aren't working. Um, because you will need the map making capability later. And then on Wednesday, uh, we're going to talk about the pure localization setting. Um, obviously, we want to drive the cars fast. And while Cartographer is ostensibly real time and fast, it's not fast enough. So we're going to talk about a, a simpler problem, which is just pure localization and how to do it at like 30 hertz um, so that you don't crash your car into the wall because you want to do a process. Um, so yeah, that's it for today. Thank you. More questions? Alright, let's go. <laughs> you don't want to record it? <laughs>